Uh, we're very lucky to have three veteran designers from Pixar, Paul Conrad, Craig Foster, and Laura Meyer, who are going to explain to us their behind the scene processes in choosing lettering and design motifs for Pixar films. Pixar Animation Studios needs uh, no introduction, so I'm just gonna present our speakers one at a time and try to guess which characters from Pixar films might be modeled after each of them. All right, first step, today we have Craig Foster. Craig uh, joined Pixar in 2004, so he's basically a lifer. And he's designed graphics for feature films, including The Incredibles, Wall-E, Inside Out, and Coco. And Craig was graphics arts director for Toy Story 4 as well. And in 2019, Craig was inducted to the Academy of Motion Picture Arts. So we have a celebrity amongst us. Craig said that when he graduated college with degrees in both fine art and philosophy, his grandfather told him that at least he'll understand why he can't find a job. Okay, everybody, let's welcome Craig Foster. Hi. So, uh, Craig Foster and uh, graphic arts director of Pixar. And this is gonna be kind of interesting uh, because you're all type people. I'm type person by default because uh, I'm incredibly dyslexic. So type wasn't something that I paid a lot of attention to except for legitimizing things I saw. Like if it looked like an important font, then I thought that was an important sign. If it was a fancy font, I figured that was had some legitimacy that I should pay attention to. Um, not until I got into film uh, and had to start making graphics to legitimize props and stories did I start really paying attention to what fonts represented and meant and the stories that they convey in themselves. So I'm going to jump into my keynote and hopefully you're all seeing this. Um, that's me, Craig Foster. That's one of the characters that you might be familiar with that I've worked on quite a bit. Uh, Lightning McQueen, and a lot of fonts. When I first started working on that, I didn't realize making all of these products would <laughs> lead me into having to learn about what fonts represent, what types of uh, uh, logos and, and branding and how that all falls together. Um, I was more into this, sketching. I thought I'd be making flames and graphics on cars but as we moved through and was creating all these different characters and all these different paint schemes, you know, fontography became more important. Even hand lettering, as you can see, like in Fritter, where we have her school bus uh, work and the hand painted stuff to give her a backstory. Well, that leads into a lot of working with type to tell stories on our characters from the crazy eights to the racing world to the modern racing world, to even more, oh my gosh, the spotter guides that we do for merchandising, all different types of cars, to uh, making a sense of place, you know, the Thunder Hollow, what, what type of uh, sponsors and stuff. Can't take credit for all of this. We work with a big team that had a hand in creating a lot of these. Um, Paul Conrad, who you'll be hearing from, and I worked on these, a lot of hand painted fonts. The tractors when they showed up, how to convey that they would, you'd believe they were racers even though they're these tractors. Um, is an example of when we get in there and do hand lettering, we really try to get our, uh, show the hand, paint strokes, more of that, trying to be uh, specific to the era and to the hand lettering and, and his personality. Locations, using um, type to really sell, like in this example, the South and all the various wayfinding that they might have. Ads for that location, try to give that believability. And so from my perspective, I'm using um, fonts to uh, sell a sense of place and a further story so that we believe these really exist. We've got our Dynaco light. N2O Cola, whole bunch of brands, just all through the eras, trying to give uh, 
sense of history, so you'll believe that these brands have been around for a long time. And you can see some older brands mixed in with some of the newer ones. Inside the cotter pin, cotter pin logo, that was something Paul came up with, but it just, it tells you that they've been around a long time and everything's fitting in that world. And then all the posters for the bands and uh, races that were happening in that region. Pixar films, we always have a bulletin board. So when I was going to school, uh, I started off as, I was taking auto mechanics at the uh, vocational college. And I saw a sign that said, uh, artwork needed for a newspaper. Well, I thought that sounded better. I was into art. <laughs> didn't realize how much text there'd be at a newspaper and being dyslexic, that didn't work out so great with the key lining and stuff. But I did learn the look of newspapers. So here we go in as the graphic artist, creating all of this, get it into the set looking correctly. We key line all these so we can see the story points we need to see while still feeling real. But if we were to take all of these out and lay them out on a table, you'd see where the blank areas are and how we move the te text around so that it's readable while still being stacked. And then we create all the things in the background, all the labels on the packaging, and all the things on the desk. Creating a sense of place like the uh, Florida 500, all the bands, the motion graphics going into the race. We have to create every element of that to make it believable. So we go in and brand the environment, brand the racing event that goes there and do media packets, lower thirds, banners. The museum, here you see a lot of, uh, just trying to convey that McQueen's been around a while, but he's more of a modern racer as opposed to some like uh, you know, Doc Hudson, whose treatment would be a lot more um, vintage. We go in and uh, kind of do like a, a museum curator and set it all up and help the viewer's eyes. I when we go to Sterling's uh, office and sees all the branding, we got in there, uh, Paul Conrad, Josh Holtzclaw, myself, uh, created a whole bunch of brands to try to make it believable. So you'd think that you'd believe that there was these cleaners and supplies and grills that were set up to uh, promote McQueen while he's being the spokesperson. Um, little inside joke, uh, we, you know, we talked about doing the lower thirds and such. Well, breaking news, that was one of my first big jokes at Pixar. Um, the director thought it was really funny, cars breaking. I actually didn't know it was spelled wrong. I thought it was correct. And so I just kind of owned it, said, yeah, I meant to do that. So breaking news, go into a film like Ratatouille. Uh, it, was, it had a hand help, uh, handmade look, but we create the things like the uh, Anyone Can Cook cookbook, do the key lining, all the writing, uh, trying to make it believable. We also do the, as the graphics people, like those uh, pastries, we do the tabletop setup, uh, treat it like a uh, photo shoot and do the illustrations. So that was uh, Gusto kind of in the hand of the night kitchen, trying to make a believable looking cookbook for our era. Uh, these fonts, we took Harley Jessup's handwriting. He did a various um, uh, alphabets for us and we converted them into fonts to use that through, Harley Jessup was the production designer. And then we do this illustration, get that all set up. So. Um, as a viewer, when Remy's going through the cookbook, you learn the various areas of a kitchen and while looking like perhaps a French illustration. Go into a film like Up, Paul and I, I Laura worked on this. Um, one of the things that we had in that was the Life magazine in the adventure book. Uh, they wanted a 1920s life. Well, the titles were hand drawn, so we go in, try to create, recreate that. Um, get the illustration in there so you feel like this could be a real life magazine cover from that era while still living in our world. Um, when we go in, we generally will get a thing like this, like there's a set and we're told that it's a map room and it's dark anonymous and it has to have a sense of history. So as the graphic artist, we create, we do research, 
do a lot of sketches, various type treatments, handwritten um, typewriters from that era, uh, what maps might or what maps look like in the real world, and then go in and recreate that to fit our environments and call it all out, lay it out for the viewer. So we are doing the graphic arts direction, but also all the handwritten and printed material. So there's a hand-drawn map with a lot of Muntz's notes. Um, the idea being it started off as a pristine map and over the years he kept adding to it and slowly kind of losing it. So you get a scene like this that really shows Muntz's place and his state of mind. Uh, ominous. There we go. Where the bird is. Poor Kevin. So all graphic design. The dog collars with the maps. We even go in there. You'll see some fonts in that, but trying to create film strips, believability for the age, months working with uh, technology from his time period and how that might look when it was fully realized. Wally, we go in. I know I'm kind of putting this on blast. There's so much I could show, but I kind of wanted to show things that you might not think that we have a hand in, um, but are also type driven. Um, looks dev for Wally. This was a big team uh, putting all this together. What well, we wanted things to look like, um, colors, fonts, going in and actually the fonts for each area. Command fonts for Otto's command bridge. Uh, utilitarian fonts for uh, the loading bays and so forth. More fonts, how they might be laid out. Advertising, how it's going to look as we go to each region of the ship. Um, you go from econo to luxury, so they change as we go forward. Get that all together. How they look in a group with repeating art. So that when we put it all in, you have a real sense that these products might um, are purchasable, that this could be a real place. And through the use of motion graphics and type. MU had a lot of type projects in it, which was kind of interesting, like reimagining the dossier, uh, getting it up from the original monsters to how it would look like um, 10 years in the past, because we had to go backwards from what you had seen in MU or in Monsters, Inc. to when they were going to college. Again, lots of fonts, uh, typography, lining. One of the things we did was create the uh, custom alphabet for the fraternity and sororities. And then how they might, we do the treatments to show how they might look fully realized in a real world environment and being manufactured. One of the big story points was the um, scareboard at, at Monsters, Inc. And it was set in a time period that, you know, in the future, so we had to retro design that. So um, I went in and came up with more of like a subway board using flip numbers and Lexi numbers and so forth. And we designed it to have the map as flips as opposed to a video board. Um, as the graphics artist, you go in and then pick the fonts you want, do animation tests that did these in After Effects to show how it might look once it's in the film. Uh, numbers counting down. They should be counting down. But this is a, and then this is a mock up of how it looked in the film. Uh, all the numbers and letters in the map was being driven by uh, the graphic artist and motion graphics. There it is, really working. Finding Dory, once again, you know, adding legitimacy to the environment, uh, creating the Marine Life Institute map that they would use to find their way through the story and uh, quarantine to the open ocean exhibit. Uh, we did all the kiosks within the uh, Marine Life Institute. And tried to give it that kid quality, so a child might want to go up to it, but still be believable as a mechanical or an electronic element. Here's an example of uh, how we get in and use 
uh, the graphics to make a set uh, look like more believable and lived in. That's what we get when it was set up and dressed. And we create calendars, uh, posters, paperwork, little stickers, the coffee logo. So give it the sense of uh, lived in and history that you would um, just not question what, what that room is to things that you are familiar but still fall away. Inside out, the bakery, there's so much in this one as well. But I thought this one was kind of fun because it's completely hex driven until you get inside. So we create all the signage, try to make something that looks like you'd see it in the San Francisco Haight-Ashbury area. Um, we come up with the names. Uh, I had originally thought for a backstory that they were a group that had followed Led Zeppelin to San Francisco during the summer of love and ran out of money. So they started a pizzeria called Stairway to Eleven. Or maybe they were uh, anarchists so they had their vulgar display of flour. But uh, the director, Pete, ended up liking Yeast of Eden. And the backstory on that was it was literary students that once they had graduated um, were having trouble making money, so they opened this bakery. And I had some relation, I could relate to that. So uh, that's what we went with. Create all the signage inside, uh, flyers. Um, Lost Bird, drawing of Lost Bird, and that's actually the extension for Jay Schuster at Pixar. So if you want to call him and give him a hard time, that's his extension there on the full tabs. Uh, we've got even some more things. We create all the signage to give it that sense of believability, mock it up how it might look. And we also had the Riley's hockey team that she played for when she moves to San Francisco called it the Foghorns. We do the uh, logo and the uh, mark, well, the whole kit and caboodle on that one. Who they might play. I thought it'd be funny if they their big rivals was a town outside of uh, San Francisco known as Fairfax, where I live. And so they were fight, playing against the uh, Fairfax Fighting Vegans. A little angry beef there with his carrots. Um, in her room, to show a sense of time, uh, there's these little characters, uh, cards that were laying around. I came up with an idea of doing um, little puckers. Uh, it didn't get into the movie. They said that people might uh, misconstrue what it said. I don't know why. I thought it was pretty funny, but uh, one of the little things that we do there for uh, creating elements. When we get into Toy Story 4, which I just have finished, uh, which again, a lot of, a lot of hype. Uh, creating history between Gabby, Gabby, and Woody, what their packaging might look like, uh, things from Woody's heyday, um, you know, and then modern, well, I just lose track of everything. But anyway, so I had these locations, and one of the ways I work after going through all that, what we do on films, is I like to use um, fonts to give a sense of space. So as you move through, you the viewer knows they're moving from one location to the next, and if they go back, they have these anchors. Um, one of the ways that I do that is I always go through and I set up my regions with how what fonts I'll use in each one. Uh, so Tri-County uh, at the school was very informational. Uh, utility, uh, Grand Basin was, um, it was trying to be like a upper Midwest, but I didn't want Woody to ever feel comfortable in his environment. So if the camera ever stopped and there was a big sign behind him, it wouldn't be Western font. So it wouldn't be like Woody's Roundup, but you would still believe that this was a Western town. So there are serif fonts in that, but they're not Old West, except for the one that snuck in Barbershop, which I don't, that's not what's in the movie, but that was in my mock-up. RV Park was a lot of hand-painted sign. Uh, then the highway informational stuff, the antique store. Um, and then the carnival, which was all manufactured with hand painted and airbrushed. The town itself, then we go in and create the elements to give that. Uh, so you'll believe there's a town of Grand Basin. Uh, to sell that, we had this idea. If you see the town seal in the middle that's on our uh, manhole covers and so forth, uh, that's a, an armadillo with a rooster on his back. The pitch on it was that as the 1886, a wagon train going across the Midwest 
these two walked across the plains in front of them and the leader of the group says, this is where we're gonna make our town. And everyone's like, why? There's nothing here. It's just this grand basin. And he says, because if these two can live in peace, so can we. And they made a town. And so that became Grand Basin and all its signage. And here's how that, whoops. And here's how that looks when it all comes together with the paintings on the side, uh, the general store, all the other shops, um, carnival. We also do uh, help out with shading. So in a sense with the antique store, this is just one example, but an antique cash register. That's how it looks in the movie. And this is what we hand off. Uh, graphics for the displacement maps, the fonts for the, the keys, and for the area for the totals. So that's just a painting that I did. And it sits there on a flat plane, but it looks like the windows and the number counters. Here's an example of what we get, storyboards. What we design, <laughs> come up, do a lot of research. I'm trying to get through this really quickly because this is a good one. A lot of fonts, a lot of different neon, figuring out what's going on, create that believability, do our mock-ups to pitch it. It just needs to be a quick read signal that it's safe to try to break into the cabinet. We land on an idea. And here's how you see it in the shot. Oh, there it goes, Gabby. Boom. And there's our big read. Uh, building out from the town, the kids' field trip. There's a lot going on here. Uh, the park, everything you see. Uh, this was an idea that uh, showing you the books, magazines, and so forth within the antique store. Advertisements, more books, all graphics that we do. Oh. <laughs> Through this end, so you can see where you see all those. <laughs> but it gives that, you know, helps sell that believability. And then cups in the store. I just hit my 20, so I'm thinking maybe I'm, my time is up. But that's, that's a quick preview of Craig Foster and everything that I try to contribute to the films. So I'm going to hand off. Okay. Hi, everybody. It's me again. Thank you so much, Craig. That was awesome. Um, next up, we have Laura Meyer. And uh, Laura joined Pixar in 2008, and she has produced title graphics and end credits for almost every recent Pixar project. And most recently, she served as graphic and title designer for Soul, which is coming out on November 20th. Laura explained that she has always loved type. And when she was a little girl, whenever she got a new coloring book, she would flip through the pages to find the ones that had letters on them so she could color those in first. And nothing's changed. Let's all welcome Laura. You're Sarah, on. My name is Laura Meyer. I have worked for Pixar as a graphic designer for about 12 years now. I'm gonna talk a little bit about the graphics and how we approach filling a graphics heavy set. Um, a little bit about title and credits design and then a bit about our localization strategy. Um, so Paul and I worked on Onward together, and I was assigned the gas station set. Paul will talk a lot about how the look and the feel of the graphics was established. I'm going to focus on how we got from here. Let's see if I can get the door. From here to here. Much like Craig just told you, this is what we start with. This is the set that, that we're handed. So my first thing is like, how am I going to fill this? How am I going to make this feel real to you. I want it to feel familiar. So how do I start? So I start with a brainstorming session. So Bert and Paul and Noah, who is our production designer, got together um, and just started throwing out ideas. What, what could be real? Um, we wanted believable products that exist in the real world, but also fit into our fantasy world. Um, so I just wanted many names and names. I actually had like three pages of this that I wrote down while we were 
sitting there doing that. It's one of my favorite things to do there. Um, but by starting with a name, then I have the visual language I need to create the graphics, especially when it's something that there's that many. So here's where I started. Um, and each one of these has variants, two to three different flavor variants to add depth and texture to the products in the set. Um, this also gives us a bit of an opportunity to add some hidden gems and, and humor. And so in the top left is a shout out to our art coordinator whose last name was Oyster. Um, you can see Clocheck Mix, which was a nod to Noah. Um, before Onward was Onward, we need to have a name, so we called it Trio. So you can see in the upper right, um, it's Scanlon's Trio Chocolate Bar. Um, and then you might have noticed if you've seen Onward that um, Triple Dent from Inside Out also makes an appearance. So this is, I just kind of keep pumping graphics out and, and try to fill the set to make it feel real. Um, some graphics are more important than others. Um, they're more of a story point. And so these will, you take a little bit more time in it. Um, these cheese puffs and, and sparkle sticks were two of those products for that set. Um, so I create variants and then pitch them to the director. And a lot of times in, in this case, um, I used a custom typeface. So I started with a typeface and then just modified it to feel in our world. Sometimes I, I often don't like to use fonts right out of the box. It feels a little bit like you might identify that font and, and I don't want you to spend more time looking at what font I used. I want you to notice that it's a cheese puff. So there's cheese puffs and that's what I showed to Dan and what's on the left is what he ultimately picked. And same with sparkle sticks. Um, so that's kind of how I approach um, a big set like that. Um, it's, I, it's, it's really a fun thing to do. Um, so one of the things I do is I work on the titles and our end credits for our features and our shorts. Um, and I approach these a little different. Um, this type has to stand alone. Um, so my goal is to support the imagery without competing or dominating what it is. I don't want to take the, I don't want the type to take the audience out of the scene, but I also want to help set the expectation and the feel of the movie. Um, and then this also helps establish the language that I will use for the end credits. So I generally pitch these two things in tandem. So this is Good Dinosaur. Um, and this is how I pitched it. Um, so for my first pitch um, with the director is, is pretty broad. I go for a wide range of typefaces that would fit the feel of the movie. And I kind of go with, okay, this feel, the scene is, the scenery is beautiful in this movie. So let's pick a beautiful typeface. Well, the scene, all, the movie also has a bit of a Western feel. So let me throw in a typeface like that. I want to make sure that I'm offering enough variations in size and case and boldness and alignment. Um, I want to present enough to get the conversation started, but not too much to overwhelm. I feel like that's partly my job is, you know, I throw 25 different pitches at them. You know, what are they going to, you know, waffle through to get to what they want. So I feel like that's part of my job is to edit it out and, and so cohesive um, look, very few of our directors are type nerds. Um, so hierarchy is really, really important. We put a lot of effort into our credits and at least once every movie, I will get on my soapbox and remind everybody that these credits are about the names. So I want to make sure that the names are read um, first and foremost. Um, and then sometimes I get lucky and we pick a font on or a typeface on the first meeting. Um, and other times I go back and time and time again. And then my main job is to integrate that into the shot, into whatever these credits are going to look like. How do you see what you're looking at, but also that that name complements what you're looking at. I want you to read those names. Um, here's another example of integrating the type into the scene. Um, I'm helping to move the movie forward without losing the energy of the shot. So what I actually want is I want the audience to say, yes, Pixar Animation Studios film with that same energy. Uh, another example is the Piper main title. Again, quiet and peaceful. How does it not compete with what's happening, but you read the title as well as look at the animation. Um, here are some of my pitches for the Inside Out end credits. 
um, they wanted something very abstract. And so these actually were all motion. So I would bring them all to the meeting and, and kind of pitch what, hey, these are options we can look at. I knew ahead of time that Pete really liked um, Clarendon. So I kind of started with that, but, um, and that was one of those I got lucky and he picked something the first time. And then this is actually what it ended up looking like at the end. Um, so if Coco is a little different, we wanted to push that look a bit more. Um, I tried lots and lots of typefaces and we had lots of rounds of reviews. Um, ultimately, Harley Jessup and I loved the imperfection of making the alphabet um, by hand. And we finally decided on this hand lettering that was inspired by the lettering on the studio outside of the Mexican artist, um, Jose Guadalupe Posada, as you can see in the bottom right. Um, so I drew all of these by hand and and then use swank to complement. That's the, that's the um, typeface above it. Um, but then 600 names is a bit hard to kern and do by hand. So I had to go back and pitch ideas that complemented and integrated with that hand lettering. And then these are the final images um, for Coco. Um, the bow end credits. This was a very personal story for Domi. So I wanted to capture that feel. So I had her write a couple of sentences so that I could get her feel for her handwriting and then pitch this idea to her and she loved it and here we are. Um, but to simplify my life and to be able to respond to the inevitable changes in credits, I made this into a font so that we could just type it in. Um, same with, this is the Pearl End Credits, which is a spark short. Um, Kristen wanted, it to feel like yarn and kind of the only non-cheesy way I could find to do that was to do it all by hand. Um, this isn't a font, this is just my writing and then I complemented it with Gotham so that it wouldn't compete with it. I wanted you to read again the names first. Um, and then logo design is also a, another interesting attempt and um, we have about 96 frames, about three seconds to grab the viewers attention and kind of convey a little bit um, some essential information about what's going to happen. So Smash and Grab is Spark Short. Um, the two main characters are tethered together. So how do I communicate that? So these are the big one is the final image and then these were other pictures that I had had um, shared with Brian. Um, same with Kipple, same thing. They wanted a graffiti look. So I pitched a bunch of different things. This is the ultimate look one they've chosen. And then here are three other handwritten um, logo designs that I've done. And again, I had a ton of pitches um, and I used all kinds of different fonts and I tried a bunch of different handwriting and directors seem to really like to lean towards that because it's not something that, it's different, it's unique. It's, it's, there's a special feel to when something is handwritten. Um, so the last thing that I wanna talk about is our um, localization effort. Um, we localized the movies throughout about 43 different countries across the globe, from Arabic to Italy to Thailand. Um, we want to keep the audience engaged in our movies, so the important story points that are communicated visually in the domestic versions, we recreate those graphics. Um, here's a couple of examples, some things you might recognize. We want our audience to feel like the movie was made for them. Um, in that moment when Carl flips to the page where Ellie thanks him for the adventure and tells him to go create a new one, if a subtitle appeared, it would immediately take you out of that scene. And it's such an important moment in that movie. Um, sometimes it's very straightforward, like a newspaper headline, that bulletin board that Craig showed you. Yeah, we localized all of that. So that showed up in 43 different languages and that was a lot of newspapers. But those are pretty straightforward. Sometimes it looks like this. Regardless, either way, it, it's a lot of graphics. Some movies are far easier than others. Um, Dino had five graphics that we touched, not a whole lot of words, words in the dinosaur world. Um, Toy Story 3 had 48, Incredibles 2 had 63, Cars 2 had 77. So there's a lot that we do um, 
to make our movie, make you part of our movie. Anyway, that's all I have. Thank you so much for listening. Woo, thank you, Laura. Okay, last but not least, we welcome Paul Conrad. Uh, Paul started at Pixar in 2007, and Paul has served as graphic designer on Up, on Coco, on Incredibles 2, and most recently as the graphic art director for Onward. Uh, Paul has been passionate about creating exciting designs and illustrations since he picked up his very first crayon. The tools may have changed over the years, but his passion remains. Everybody, let's welcome Paul. All right. Let's see if I can do this. Uh-oh. Hang on. Can we see that? Great. Okay. Um, like Grendel said, my name is Paul Conrad, and uh, I work at Pixar. I'm a graphic uh, art director, and I've worked on several films and in various capacities. Um, but all of these are you know, completely team effort projects. Uh, not only are you working with other graphic designers, but you're working with uh, concept artists and you're working with shaders and you're working with the modelers, um, everybody. So uh, what I'm gonna talk about today is um, being the art director on Onward. So, Onward, uh, when I started, they already knew that it was a film about a world that starts off in kind of a, uh, a fantasy genre like, um, you know, like Conan or like Lord of the Rings or something like that. And that it evolves to one day, but all of these elves and orcs and centaurs, you know, have uh, existed and evolved since then. And so basically, it's kind of our world that you see outside the window, but through that lens. So what I needed to do as um, the graphic artist on this film at the beginning was try to figure out, well, how do we translate, you know, what our signage, our branding, all those types of things look like in this world that is going to be so heavily influenced by, um, you know, this fantasy type of feel. Um, so I looked at a lot of fonts and I wanted to try to pull in um, some black, you know, black letter, uh, you know, typefaces as well as other things that kind of conveyed this old world feel, but with the added challenge of making sure that it was legible, you know, for our, our all ages audience. So, you know, on the left here, you can see some of the kind of key fonts that we use. Corrigan kind of became our basically kind of our Helvetica or Futura of this world. Um, and then you can kind of see how that might have influenced everything else. Sometimes uh, there were fonts or typefaces that we wanted to use that we didn't have or couldn't find. So sometimes we'd just have to actually make the letters, you know, maybe for shorter usage for logos or, or whatever. Or like this, you know, below that you can see the one through six kind of what would the digital font look like in this world? You know, when you go to a gas pump or you, you know, pull out a calculator or whatever. And then also, you know, we would try to kind of design some, some detail work that would support this, that would help communicate, you know, that there are these different kind of cultures that all came from this, you know, kind of medieval fantasy old world kind of background. So there's heavily, you know, there, it's heavily influenced by, um, you know, various, you know, real world, uh, usually European types of cultures. Um, the shape language wanted to try to find some generic shapes that we could put our signage in or that would inform some of the different things that we would design. And so we wanted to have this kind of shield and, 
and ribbon type of look to it. Also, we knew that since this world had, <clears throat> you know, evolved from this, this uh, old world fantasy thing, we knew that there would be ancient uh, ruins and obelisks and structures that would still kind of populate and be like old fountains and things like that around this modern day culture. So uh, we wanted to come up with kind of a, an old world runic, you know, type of symbology and then show how that could be modernized, um, you know, in a way that this modern culture would, you know, be able to see it and understand it. So how that informs, you know, all the signage and the different types of banners and things that you would see in this modern world, you can see examples up here. So top left, you know, that's, you know, a highway freeway sign and how, you know, this feeling of, you know, medieval nature is affecting that. Um, you know, you can see kind of the updating to, can you see my little cursor? Okay. So you can see this updating of the Pizza Planet logo in this world. Um, you can see, you know, the city crest, which we would use like on a manhole cover, and then how that kind of informs this banner for this mushroom fest that's happening. You know, how this detail work can help kind of affect this uh, highway sign here. And, you know, you're still using the same colors, but we're using these, uh, you know, old English and, and um, black letter fonts, but then we're also adding this kind of, you know, slim line detail work. Or, you know, here's an example of what money looks like in this world. You know, here's some examples of some products and packaging. We got to design a lot of that sort of thing. And again, we wanted to try to make it look contemporary, but also look like it it somehow came from this, this other world, which I know is funny because um, our modern day uh, typography and graphic design actually did in reality evolve from that time. So, um, so I guess in some ways it's maybe a little regressive, but um, had fun designing um, these energy drinks or, you know, the soda pop or this, you know, fruit runes is kind of a cereal box you know, my backstory for it is that that's Barley's favorite cereal, Fruit Runes. Uh, Trollio's is Ian's favorite cereal. So that says a lot about their identities, that one's a little more healthy and straight-laced and the other one's kind of party time. Um, got to design kind of the branding and signage uh, for this gas station chain called Swamp Gas. And so design what the signs would look like and how it would play out over gas pumps and, and all of that. Got to design, um, you know, these neon beer signs that would show up in the windows and, and like, you know, kind of the accompanying brand that goes with that. And then as far as, you know, graphic design work that would actually happen on the characters, you know, just like in Russell and Up where he's got all these little merit badges, we get to design those types of things as well. So Barley is, you know, into role-playing games, but he's also into heavy metal. So we got to come up with these really cool, you know, band names and logos that would be patches that would, you know, get embroidered on his, on his denim vest. So front, back, these really cool patches would come about but then also you would take those and use them for stickers because Barley kind of plasters the entire, you know, inside of his van with all of this stuff. This is some, some stuff that shows up inside of his van. So, you know, I said that he's got stickers all over the inside, but he's also got, you know, posters of his favorite bands or uh, this quest of your blacklight poster, you know, because he likes to play this role playing game quests of your or, you know, these rock shows that he went to, or, you know, this hand lettered cassette tape of his, you know, awesome jams. Um, at one point in the film, the boys are given this letter that their dad wrote, you know, years before. And so it explains how this spell 
is supposed to be performed. So um, what I did there is I found a, a font that, that is a cursive font that was easy to read. But then what I did was I traced it in pencil and gave it a little bit of my own handwriting because it's supposed to be in dad's handwriting. And um, my experience is that a lot of dads like me, our handwriting isn't so good or so pretty. And so I wanted to purposely make it look a little, you know, a little less than, than gorgeous. And then it's supposed to have been on this piece of paper that's aged up in the attic. And so, you know, got to add some, you know, fading and distress and all of that. And, you know, did the graphics, you know, these illustrations as well that are supposed to indicate not only to the boys, but to the audience, what they can expect to happen, you know, when they perform this spell and bottom right, how long it's going to last. They have 24 hours. So it helps convey to the audience that, hey, they're on the clock. Uh, Quests of Yore, this is the role-playing game that's super important to Barley. And it becomes important to Ian because in this world, uh, it's more like a historical document. It, it tells you everything you need to know about all of these creatures, but also about uh, how to perform these spells. So there's, it's basically a how-to book on, on how to cast these spells. And that also, uh, the other thing within this game that, that Barley and his buddies play, there are these playing cards, and they kind of identify the power level of these items and, you know, what you would get, you know, at these different places. So the mana core card is important. That's where they need to go to get information from the mana core on their quest to get the Phoenix gym. So I'm not showing you all the versions of these things like Laura did. I'm, I'm happy that she did so that you guys understand that this stuff doesn't just come out you know, one try. Um, there's a lot of uh, iteration and versions that are happening. And, you know, you're wanting to, you know, show as many ideas as you can. And then, you know, maybe there's some refining that happens once a couple of those designs are chosen. Um, so the idea here is that it's this awesome, big leather bound um, role playing guidebook but that it's also this historical document. And then the other thing that goes along with this is as it's being designed, I'm being told that consumer products are actually going to make a product that people can go out and buy based on this book. So, you know, everything has to be, you know, fit their specs as well. Oh, and another thing, just like uh, Craig was mentioning, um, you're doing a lot of copywriting yourself as a graphic designer here. So, you know, these cover blurbs and things like that, I'm coming up with. These are, this is what, you know, a hero spread within this book would look like. So, you know, and it, it has to be big and bold so that it's easy for everybody to read and understand, you know, in a quick look. So this is the growth spell. It tells a little bit about it. Uh, the incantation is there, and then this magic decree, which is giving you a little insider info that you've got to magnify your attention on this object to magnify it. And then over on the right, like a lot of these fun, you know, role-playing game books, there are these kind of like bombastic over-the-top illustrations that are showing these wizards of yore performing these things. So, um, our concept art team, uh, you know, got to do these illustrations. And we also wanted to have there be a little bit of difference in between because we wanted to convey that, you know, whoever was publishing this book was having to hire a lot of different freelance illustrators, you know, to do this. Also, besides these big hero pages, there had to be what, what we would call filler pages that the characters are like flipping past to get to these hero pages that the camera's gonna spend a little more time on. So you have to show some things that you're flipping past. It can't be identical and it can't be blank. So I would take like things down here, I would take concept art of these different uh, species and put them there and maybe kind of 
Greek in some areas that are talking about each one of them or put in some of these magic items like a staff and talk about that. At one point in the film, Barley uh, is talking to a centaur character and is explaining to him all the really cool things that centaurs used to be do, used to be able to do back in you know years ancient years past and how they used to be able to drive you know, uh, run you know 75 miles per hour or whatever and you know he can point to that book and say see um, now later in their quest they're going to the manacor's tavern and so a big setup for this is that it's going to be this really spooky scary place and as they approach it uh, from one side, it's we find out later it's the back entrance. It used to be the old ancient entrance to this place. And so there's this old uh, kind of English tavern sign that's carved out of wood and it's really spooky. So I get to design and illustrate that and then work with 3D modelers and shaders to pull that off in reality in the film. So what you find out when they come in, ta-da, this thing has been gentrified and turned into kind of a, a TGI Fridays type of place over the years. So, you know, if you see this, this is the, the outside signage and logo. Um, it's kind of the modernization of that old English one. So inside, you know, we got to develop all the branding uh, for inside the Manicor's Tavern. And it's got these you know, cheesy, you know, kind of slogan banners hanging throughout the place. And it's got these tabletop, you know, menus with these different items. And we got to, you know, come up with that stuff. Like Laura was saying, sometimes you would brainstorm with, you know, a group of people that, ha you know, are role-playing game folks that really know this stuff inside out. And they'll come up with really fun, you know, kind of ideas that you can kind of key off of. And so this is like the outside of the big menu. Uh, this would be like a, a menu holder stand. And um, this is like the kids menu, which becomes a, an important part in the film later. And also got to design all the flair uh, that went on, you know, all the employees, including the Manicor. And, you know, just all these different kinds of cheesy slogans, adventures back on the menu, uh, today's special adventure, you know, all that kind of stuff. And so you wanted to design these with the feeling that they actually could be, um, you know, these little manufactured pins that, you know, the different employees could wear, as well as, you know, a name tag that would also kind of carry the brand forward. Uh, within the the tavern, there's this little arcade area and kind of wanted to have this cheesy illustration that would kind of indicate that maybe that that area was pretty plussed out in the 80s or 90s. And it just really it hasn't up too much since then, you know, got to design the fun zone area logo and, you know, how this uh, claw gauntlet game looks and smite a knight. Um, and that kind of stuff. So there's another corner where uh, the manicor, if you follow my cursor, where um, she has this wall of adventure. And so it's covered with these different, you know, major items that she's collected along the way. And this Phoenix gym map is what the boys need. And so we get closer on it. And I wanted it to look like one of these uh, J.R. Tolkien uh, types of maps. Um, at one point, uh, this speaks a little bit to, you know, iteration and, and evolution of your design work. At one point, it looked a lot more uh, like one of those types of maps. But as we went through the process, it was determined that Phoenix Jim needs to be written big and bad on this so that it can be read further away from it. And then this back here is just kind of a map design that I created that would go over, um, you know, three or four walls in the background. The Manicor herself, uh, it's an important story point. Um, she has these tattoos on her arms. And uh, the majority of them kind of detail these different events 
that and adventures that she's had. And so, you know, I just want to kind of show a lot of tropes, you know, fighting a hydra and a giant spider. And the most in ones, the, the main story point ones are that there is this Phoenix gym and there's a curse attached to it. And it when it uh, activates, it will draw these materials, rocks or whatever, to form this dragon, but that the heart of it is kind of its weak spot. And then our other arm, she shows this weapon, this enchanted weapon, the curse crusher that she had, that she used to kill this. So that now they got to get a crush, curse crusher. Okay. Um, we got to do things like design what the mom's phone looked like when she's using her, her map quest uh, type of app and when her boyfriend calls and he's her main man, what that looks like. And then when it gets to uh, just the regular call screen, kind of our version of what these different things look like. <clears throat> so now we're at the high school. So um, got to design what the mascot was going to look like, which is important. Um, you know, went through a lot of uh, variations of that. Um, the mascot is the dragons, go dragons. There's, you know, kind of one of these uh, digital boards outside where they can put different messages. And then also got to design um, what the stonework, what the inlay on the stonework would look like and, you know, where that would go on the outside of the building. Inside the classes, um, got to have fun designing uh, curriculum that the teachers would order to put up on their walls, but also got to design things like uh, what the kids would do for like the spirit week. So I wanted to have some stuff like this map detailing this, you know, ancient battle uh, or this map of uh, Lemuria or why do we study geography and make that look like stuff that these various teachers would order but then this stuff is supposed to look like the, you know, the spirit crew got together and painted this stuff up by hand. And then you can see how it's placed, you know, in these different rooms. Uh, here's some more examples like, you know, this is uh, the founding, one of the founding fathers of their culture, or this is like a poster that you would see outside of a counselor's office, um, the, the theater team. And again, this is stuff that's painted, you know, by the kids. And then maybe this is something they had printed up at a local printer for the big jousting tournament. I also got to design uh, all this inlay work that would go on these ancient structures. And then, so this is what it looks like when I'm designing it and when I'm planning for these different levels. Uh, and then the shading team would come along and just really age it up and, and bring it to life within the actual stonework. And then lastly, one of the, la uh, it's actually one of the first uh, sequences in the film, uh, but I just had a blast kind of going to town on this kind of 80s looking arcade and, but in through the eyes of this world. So these are like the sides of these cabinets for these games. And this would be like the backlit signage that would go above the games. This would be like a screen that's shown. And then uh, finally, I uh, got to do this. It was this gag that this centaur would be on this kind of uh, dancing video game. So it's Prance, Prance, Revolution. And, you know, got to design all sides of the cabinet, uh, what the dancer would be on. And then the screen elements that would be animated in After Effects later. So that's my show. Woo! Thank you, everybody. Thank you, Paul, Craig, and Laura. That was amazing. Um, we're going to take some questions now. We've got about uh, 20 minutes of Q&A, and we've got a 1,000 questions. So we're going to blast right through them. Remember, um, everybody, you can upvote the questions that you want to see answered. So um, get in there with your thumbs up. Let's take a look at our first 
question here on the list. Um, open questions. How big are the typographic set design teams and what are the different roles that people play inside them? Who wants to take that? Craig? Uh, I'll, yeah, it, like, it can be um, individ individual contributor as one graphic artist on a film, or it can be um, like 12, like on Cars 2, where we went all around the world. And then we divvy it up in leads and uh, projects and do our best to keep it all together and fit within the world. Yeah. So, on, on, yeah, on Onward, it was Laura and I doing the majority of it, but we actually had Bert uh, come in and help out and do some things as well. So really, it was just the three of us. Wow. Okay, thank you. Um, next question on the list that's been upvoted. How do you manage type licensing for the design of all the pieces, the ones that you don't design yourself? Is there a budget for type? I'll answer that. Um, we own about 15,000 typefaces. So, and, and most of those are cleared for any kind of graphics we do. Title design is a little different. There is a different budget for that. And there is certain boundaries want more. And so we don't won't necessarily use that. Directors, that's why a lot of directors love the hand done stuff. Um, I will go and, and search for fonts. I will generally pitch something. My first pitches are generally stuff we already own, um, along with handwritten stuff, if that applies. Um, but it goes through quite the legal process. Everything we do, we have to commit to. This is the font that we use. This is how I modified it, um, et cetera. So, so it, it's a big deal. Um, I hope that answers the question. Sounds good. Let's see. What apps do you use to create fonts? Oh, um, well, <laughs> for I use that. I've used Type Tool 3, which is ancient, but it was what we had. And so I just kind of muddled through it now. Um, Disney has come up with one, and I think it's called Glyphs, but I'm not sure if that's just Disney owned and we use that now or if that's something that you can buy. But um, those are the two that I've used. Okay, I should, by the way, be uh, giving props to the people who've asked the questions. We had Daniel Rocha who asked the first one, Florencia who asked the second one, and Mia who asked the third one. Now let's see here from Grace Kim, we have a question, two questions. One is, do all the faux brands and products go through legal clearance? Definitely. Sounds like yes. <laughs> yes. Very and much then happy. number two, do you make sure details are accurate? For instance, is the recipe you showed a real recipe that can be made? If that recipe was the one in uh, the cookbook, no, you would not want to make that. In fact, when it went out into the real world, um, Hallmark made a Christmas ornament and we had to make a real recipe because it's like, four sticks of sugar or four sticks of butter, eight cups of sugar, you know, it's just foolishness. Um, mm -hmm. I'll jump in real quick. Paul's written a bunch of um, ingredients for candy and cereals that consist of uh, rattlesnake venom and, <laughs> stuff and various things. So I think we have fun. So if you ever do stop and try to read things. Yeah, I lifted that from um, an old Warner Brothers Daffy Duck cartoon where he goes into this old Western bar and asks for whatever the mean ombre is drinking. And it's all this just horrible stuff. Oh, my God. Okay, I'm going to sneak in a personal question here. Which one of you is the metal head? Because you oh. hit the nail on the head for those graphics. Well, I mean, sure. I like metal. <laughs> okay. All right. Everyone's being coy here. Let's go on with the, uh, <laughs> the questions. Um, we have an anonymous attendee who said, do y'all work with type designers of that specific identity culture to not appropriate a style that they designed? 
Hmm. I mean, I currently, yes, like I'm on a film. Well, most of, we generally almost always have a, a cultural consultant. So, because I would, the last thing we, I mean, speaking for myself, but I think the team, last thing we ever want is for someone to feel that they've been marginalized by appropriating their art. Like that would mm -hmm. devastate me if I knew that happened to somebody. Mm -hmm. And um, so we definitely try to not appropriate anything. Okay, let's see, Vix Cohen asks, how long are your teams given to research before you have to start design? And is research an ongoing element in the design process? Yes and yes. <laughs> uh, before, during, sometimes even after, because you can't stop yourself. Well, and I think it's always part of the pitch, too, is you want, that's how you sell it to the director, mm -hmm. you're showing them, this is what it works in the real world, and this is how I'm, I'm making it. Yeah. So, um, it, it gives you some credibility to what you're designing. Yeah. So, yeah. yeah. We're constantly looking for reference and, you know, from everywhere. Yeah, I totally agree with, with Laura. S some, of the, some of the research is for me to understand things, to teach myself things, or, you know, or to get an idea, you know, to get a spark an idea. But I'll, a lot of times, depending on who your director is or, or what their uh, trust level is, you've got to educate them as well. So you might have to do more research than you yourself need. Yeah. Oh, is that it? Any other input on that one before we move on? To the That's next a good one? It's a great one because of that Paul just said about having to, you know, sell it to the director because they might have something in mind that uh, speaks to them emotionally from something they saw when they were a kid that's not exact it's not what how it existed in the real world and we were on cars for because we went from car toy story to cars to toy story like in a five-year period but when we had to research 1930s 40s 50s race cars and there's you know a section of the world that that's their life they're going to know everything that's not right on those cars so that was a big like really fast in-depth research project, I think, for all of us. Totally. Let's see. Claudio Fresneda says, how much of your work is then also being used in the Disney parks and merchandise? <laughs> Lots. <laughs> Lots, yeah. <laughs> OK. Uh, Graham Burroughs says, I love the idea of creating a full identity system for a fictitious product or brand. How much time do you spend on these, especially when you're having to craft so many elements that show up throughout the film? Hmm. Anyone? Well, we could use Sterling's office. We kind of all jumped in on that. And what did we have a week? <laughs> right. Yeah. yeah. So because we 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 go as fast as story. So if we don't have storyboards, we don't know what to design to. And if they decide, oh, wouldn't it be amazing if Sterling pitched all these products for McQueen, we still have, a, you know, a pipeline. So mm -hmm. we are the gate if it's graphics heavy. So we just got to jump mm -hmm. in and get it done. Yeah. Yeah, it, the time varies. Sometimes you've got a, a long time sometimes maybe too much time um and then sometimes it's like okay this is it we got a week here you go all right let's see we got idan gazid asks how do you decide what to localize and what not to especially since it's not as simple as localize and stick oh. it in the same spot re rtl languages um well, it's, it's a process. So our main goal for localization is to move the story along. So that, again, back to the bulletin board that exists in almost every movie we make, but back the one for Cars 3, um, there were a lot of story points in that that helped move the story along. And so that was one of them. So that's our main thing, the Ellie graphic 
with the adventure. That was the story point. If that's not in your language, we feel like that's going to take you out of the movie to read that subtitle. So there's an entire international department and the director will go through, um, the director of that department will go through and identify graphics. And then we pitch it to the director and just say, and the producer and say, okay, I think these are ones we should do. We also take a big swipe at trying to neutralize graphics. And so if we can get away with not replacing it with words, we'll replace it with an image. Um, which then we can use for all 43 countries and not have to do 43 versions. But that's pretty much the key thing is that, is this a story point? And another thing we do is if the graphic really fills the screen, we don't want the audience to go, what does that say? So that's, a, that's probably the biggest thing is like, is this a story point? All right, let's see. Um, Mary Lim, Maya Lim, sorry asks, you showed an uncolored outline that you would be handed off to place the design into. How do you determine color palettes that fit well with the overall movie all while it's being made? Is there back and forth on that? Is that it? It might be in relation to the dirigible map room that I showed. Uh, that was me looking up at the clock and I don't go off in notes because as I said at the beginning, I can't read notes and look at an image at the same time because <laughs> I get flustered. And the bigger explanation of that image would have been is we're part of an art department and we're the graphics team. And there's a sets department, shader art department, uh, you know, characters. And I'll, we get paintings, uh, we get color keys, um, set dressing. So that, room would have started there while another team is working on like the colors and the lighting and everything so i would know how big the map board might be where things are where months is standing so we're all working together we're kind of uh we're working as a stack moving forward as opposed to handing off and going down the line and i didn't want to not give you know props to everyone involved because it's a lot of people and you know <laughs> yeah hope that made sense <laughs> all right guthrie allen asks what advice would you give aspiring designers for film and looking to work professionally in the industry i think a lot of people had that question tonight Now, we do get that question a lot. I think we probably all have a different answer for that. Um, someone told me a long, long time ago, I think it was in recruiting, it's just like, you know, look through our art of books. It's like, do you create stuff that looks like that? Um, I, I think, but I, I think honestly, so it, it takes a while. It's a hard place to get a job. And I think, you know, it took me two times to get, I first applied in 06 and then again in 08. Um, so I think that it's just a matter of not giving up. How badly do you want to do, does your look fit into what we do? And is it diverse? It's just like, can you, can you draw? Can you, can you set type? Can you write copy? I mean, not that I can write copy, but whatever. <laughs> but I, I, I don't know. I think Paul and Craig might have a thought on that too. Um, yeah, I mean, I think that Laura's very right in that there's a lot of different answers. You know, nobody's the same and, um, you know, no job is the same. Um, I, I always tell people that um, if you're wanting to do this type of thing, then you need to, to show that you can do it. So, for example, you could give yourself some projects like a Manicore's Tavern or, you know, a brand of soda or something that's imaginary and then just play it out, you know, over these different items. Um, and I think that that's one good thing that you could do to show uh, besides being able to either illustrate or uh, set type or, or whatever, just show that you can, you know, do these various things. But I also think that she's right in that if you can do more than one thing and more than one style, that that's gonna give you a big advantage and make you more interesting. 
Okay, we should be wrapping up pretty soon. I have a couple more questions that I'm gonna um, relay to you guys and then we'll call it quits around 1.30. Um, so apologies if we didn't get to your question. There were uh, 50 some odd questions. So that's what we got. Um, let's see, what did we have here? It sounds like anonymous asks, it sounds like as the designers, you have a lot of say about the content of these graphic pieces like snack names, bakery names, et cetera. Are there times when the director writers dictate those kind of decisions? Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Yep. Yeah. <laughs> also, be nice. Yes. It's a small industry. I was going to chime into the last question. <laughs> I, I didn't get in until I was 35, and it was because of someone I'd worked for in the past who remembered me, so. Good to be nice to people. Um, yeah. Okay. <laughs> um, quickly, let's see. Uh, Diana Ovesea asks for Laura. Laura, some of the font choices you showed for one of the title designs, Bembo and Archer, etc., are so classical. Do you pitch those typefaces because you already have the licenses? Where do you usually shop for fonts? And do you feel like you give smaller independent type foundries a chance? Um, I think yes to all of that. Yes, I, I, I pitched those typefaces. Yes, we did own the licenses, but I pitched them because I thought I felt they fit the movie and, and they felt they fit a look that I wanted to pitch. Um, there's, you know, beauty in those classical typefaces. I love them. Um, but that doesn't always work in our film. Um, where do I shop for them? Uh, anywhere. <laughs> um, we did swank the, the cursive version of in the Coco end credits is a, a, a woman that designed this typeface and I, I don't even remember how we found it. Um, but so yes to all of those questions. We, I, legal would always love it if I started with something that we already owned. Um, and so I do try to, to fit that but they also know that I'm a big proponent that we're not going to try to make the director fit into this convenient box. We want it to fit the film. So that's always my main goal. Does this fit the look we want? That's great. I see that Stephen Coles has put in the chat a couple links to different um, uh, Pixar typography articles, at fonts in use, and also a article about Michael Durrett. Um, so check those out. And then I have a question here from Laura Sarah saying, when do you decide to use hand lettering versus fonts? Hmm. I, I pitch them both generally. I won't, if it doesn't fit like it should be a hand lettering, I, I won't pitch that. It, again, it is always about what it feels, right? So most of those hand lettering things I showed you, I pitch typefaces with that. They just ultimately wanted to go with something that was hand done and unique and didn't feel like, oh, look, that's Gotham. Even though I love Gotham, I use it all the time, but whatever. Anybody else weigh in on that one? Let's see, I have a question from uh, Lynn Yoon, who said, this has just skyrocketed to my dream job, spot number one. How did you all get into this career path or job? So why don't That's we end story. on that question? <laughs> All three of you answer that, and then we'll call it a day. Who do we want to start? A long with? story, yeah. Go yeah. ahead. Okay, um, I I was working at a place called Wild Brain, a post production house, when they were making The Incredibles, and basically I was Iron Giant was one of my favorite films, in my, and I just kept going. I can do anything to work with Brad Bird, and do anything to work with Brad Bird, and a producer who was at Wild Brain ended up going to Pixar and remembered hearing me roaming around whining about it so much and called and said, if you're serious, um, you need to get in here right now. And uh, I got in and held onto the desk and they couldn't get rid of me. So I'm, that's where I stayed, but it was all through um, just, I, w I always wanted to work there. Ended up getting to work there. That's well, that's how my path. <laughs> Um, mine Laura? is kind of similar. Yeah. I actually uh, was working as a 
graphic designer and I was teaching grade school and I had seen Toy Story in 95 as well and and thought, oh, that's amazing. But, you know, they don't do what I do. And I actually saw an ad in the Chronicle for a graphic designer at Pixar. And it literally changed my life. Like, oh, they do hire what I do. Um, so I went back to school and, and knew that I needed a better portfolio and a better degree. Um, and luck would have it that Andy Dreyfus, who is our um, head of creative for marketing, um, was teaching a class there and a friend of mine was in it. And so she was like, basically pushed me through the door and, and I met with Andy and then he, he was impressed, I guess. And, and so that he kept in touch with me. I met him at six and then I, again, he emailed me and said, Hey, there's this job in 08. And, and so I went through all the, what we all go through to get hired there. Um, but yeah. I, I saw an ad and I really, really wanted to do it. Um, yeah, I started, <clears throat> I started college. I studied illustration and I came out and I was woefully unprepared and couldn't find a job. So a friend of mine uh, got me on at a silkscreen place uh, and did a lot of like uh, full block university arch type sort of things. And so I really learned uh, kind of ground up graphic design uh, by hands on doing that type of work. Uh, went through several different consumer products types of positions. Uh, ended up at, in Disney, Florida, doing design work for parks, both merch and signage, helping out the Imagineer folks. And then um, got my first uh, animation production company job uh, with the VeggieTales people. And um, it, they ended up going bankrupt. I went freelance and then uh, my freelance career was going pretty good for a while. And then it started to peter out. And about that time I got a call uh, from a friend that I'd worked with at VeggieTales that worked at Pixar that said they're looking for a person with your skill set, And so I just geared up my portfolio and rolled the dice and the rest is history. Connections. Yeah. Okay, everybody, we're wrapping this up. Thank you so much, um, Laura, Craig, and Paul for, for taking the time to be here with us today. This was amazing. And thanks uh, to all the participants for joining in and uh, check in with us next week. Um, for Maurice Mayer and uh, our next letter form lecture. Okay. Have a great day, everybody. Thank you. Bye. Thank you so much. Thank you.